All right. Why don't we get started? Um, I, first of all, want to start with just a couple of disclaimers. Uh, we are recording this uh, meeting, so if someone missed it or if you have to leave early, you will have access. Everyone who registered will have access to the recording. That being said, if you don't want your camera, your, your face on video, just keep your video off. Um, and then this slide deck uh, is meant both to be presented to you live and then we'll also be sending this slide deck to everyone who registered as well. So you have all these lovely things to reference. Um, okay. So um, welcome <laughs> to our first um, monthly Mushroom of the Month webinar. Today we're focusing on June. So I wanted to um, start these webinars each month to help us prepare for what is coming up and what we can expect to see out in the woods and whatnot um, and what's good to eat so we can help connect with nature in a variety of different ways. So my name is Leah. I'm going to go over a little bit about um, some like what is environmental education at Grand Traverse Conservation District before we get started. So the Grand Traverse Conservation District um, serves Grand Traverse County and some surrounding areas and our environmental education department. Um, our mission is really to facilitate the exploration and study of the outdoors, empower individuals to play a personal role in environmental stewardship and to inspire future generations of conservation leaders. So I was really excited to have the opportunity to teach about mushrooms, which I am very um, interested in. Here's a picture of me checking out a mushroom. Down here, I'm a plant and mushroom person, so I'm all for these things and to help, you know, facilitate this study of the outdoors. Um, we also, beyond, you know, webinars like this, do a variety of other things at the Boardman River Nature Center, um, which is where the Grand Traverse Conservation District is housed. We have our nature center, which is like a gallery where you can come and check out a variety of different animals that live in Michigan. We do field trips and day camps. Uh, we also do professional development for formal and, and informal educators. Um, specifically, we do Project Learning Tree and Project Wild. We also have community resources. This is one of those events and we have a variety of resources at our nature center as well, um, related to everything, including mushrooms. And then we do community science projects. So some of you might've heard uh, that we had our amphibian conservation co community science this last week, two weeks ago, uh, where we out uh, surveying frogs, catching frogs. That was really fun. Um, so if you want to know more about environmental education at GTCD, you can go to naturescalling.org slash about edu. You can also reach out to me at any time. My name is Leah. Again, <laughs> I'm the environmental educator. So it's my job to answer any and all questions related to the environment or connect you with someone who does. Um, you know, three weeks ago, I didn't really know anything about frogs, but now I can answer all of your frog questions. And if you have any mushroom questions that I can't answer, I will also be able to answer or find someone who can answer all of those. So feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, let's see. Okay, cool. So this big scary map, I guess, is the whole reason why I wanted to do this, this thing. So has anyone ever heard of the Midwest American Mycological Information? Society, MAMI as they're called. Um, they're at MidwestMycology.org. Um, if no one has heard of them, that is okay. I hadn't either until a couple months ago. Um, they are kind of like the leading uh, voice in mushrooms in Michigan and the Midwest. And this is their calendar of mushrooms that fruit in Michigan. Um, and so every one of these, it's by month. And these are 22 different genus genera of edible mushrooms. And you can see that every month something is happening. Uh, so there's a lot of hype around morale season or out here. Uh, but as you can see, you know, fine, morales or Marcella, they have a pretty short season. Um, and so many other mushrooms that are coming out um, and that we can explore. So I wanted to give the opportunity to teach about and expose you to some of those other mushrooms. Um, and so we can foraging all year round. Um, yeah, already. I want to, before I really get into it, kind of gauge your guys's um, knowledge, how much you know about mushrooms, so I know <laughs> at what pace to go through these things. So, um, Allie, maybe if you could launch the first poll for us, we'll see. This polling thing is new to us. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay. So hopefully you all got a question that's like, how much do you feel you know about mushrooms? And then when that's okay, run, so Leah, I have the results from our poll here. Okay. Can you share them with everyone? I certainly can. So the answers range from I know nothing to I'm a mushroom expert. Most of us are mushroom novices. That is where the majority of the knowledge base is today. Um, and we have a couple of newcomers as well who are just getting started on their mushroom horrific journeys. Um, so that is great. Mushroom novice is a great place to be, a very exciting place to be because you know a couple things but you have so far to go. Um, and I wanted to, this presentation is hopefully helping to kind of uh, bridge that gap. I know when I was first, when I was considering myself a mushroom knowledge novice, I found that knowledge gap um, to like keep going very, very large. <laughs> it was very intimidating. Um, uh, hopefully everyone of whatever, uh, skill level or knowledge level you consider yourself at, you can learn something today. So this is what we're going to be going over. Um, I have about 50 slides for you tonight. We're first going to be going over personal foraging rights, so where you are allowed to forage um, and how to legally do so. I get that question a lot because it is a little confusing. We're going to go over some basic uh, mushroom ID, that kind of stuff, so we're all on the same page about what, like, how to talk about a mushroom. Uh, and then we're going to get into our wild, uh, wild, wild edibles of June, um, how to identify and harvest them. I went with four this month. I didn't want to overwhelm us too much. So we're going to go over pheasants back, uh, trumpets, chicken of the woods, and shaggy mane. And just like a disclaimer, uh, those are my preferred common names, but I'm also begin going to be using their Latin binomials. Uh, so those things are always in flux. So hopefully with both a common name and a Latin binomial, we'll know what we're talking about. Uh, and then we're gonna go over foraging and consumption best, best practices so you know how to safely uh, harvest and cook mushrooms and how to do it respectfully and sustainably. And we have some time at the end where I'm gonna share with you some of my favorite mycology resources and we can go over any questions that weren't answered during the presentation. All right, let's get into it. So foraging rights. Um, First of all, I'm going to preface this by saying this is personal foraging rights. If you want to harvest commercially to like sell to a store or a restaurant or to sell at all, um, you have to go through a whole training, um, which I have done and is very intense, but it's possible. Um, so if you're just harvesting personally, uh, like you and your family is out picking mushrooms and eating mushrooms, you can harvest off of DNR public land national for forests and then private land with owner's permission, of course. So obviously you can harvest off your own land or your mom's land or your friend's land if you have permission, but you cannot harvest off of national parks. So at Sleeping Bear Dunes or Pictured Rocks might be really tempting, but don't pick the mushrooms there, nor can you harvest off of metro or county parks. Uh, so any of the uh, any of the parks that the Dr Grand Traverse Conservation District manages, including the Grand Traverse National Edu Natural Education Reserve, which is where our campus is based, um, are no pick zones. Some uh, rules may vary. There are a couple metro and county parks that encourage foraging, and that is their purpose. So you can just check with your local municipality, and they'll let you know. But the general rule of thumb is, if it's not DNR land, a national forest, or private land that you have permission. It's a no harvest zone. Uh, so how can you find DNR public land? Uh, and what does that mean? So the Department of Natural Resources, the DNR, manages over 4.6 million acres of public land. So the public land that we can harvest off of includes state forests, uh, state parks, and then state game and wildlife areas. So unfortunately, there's not really a state map that it shows all of this public land, um, that would be really convenient, but it just doesn't exist. Um, so there are a couple different ways that you can access and discover where this land is found. First of all, if you go to a DNR customer service center, so we have one of these in Traverse City, uh, you can get this physical map. I believe this one is actually of Benzie County. Um, yeah, so they have them by county. Um, and they're not super intuitive, but if you're into physical maps, uh, that could be a good option. There's also digital maps. So Ali um, might be ever so kind as to drop this link for us in the chat. 
um, which breaks it down into state, park, and game areas. So looking at the digital map website, let's see, this is what it would look like. Um, and then down here, it has hyperlinked the state forests, the state parks, and the state game and wildlife areas. I would start with the state forests. Again, these are all separate maps because DNR has separate departments for different things. Um, but I would start with state forest because that's probably going to be your best uh, mushroom hunting territory. Thanks, Ali. Um, but you can check out state parks and game areas as well. Um, so those are DNR public lands. There's another way to find DNR public lands and also national forests at the same time. And it's at school this through this nifty little app called Onyx Hunt. So this is a great app for, it's mostly used by hunters. Like my dad uses this. Um, but I know a lot of mushroom foragers who use this app as well. And it'll show you the boundaries between state land, national forest, private land, you know, metro parks. So you always know um, what land you're on. And if you're able to forage off it, it doesn't explicit tell, explicitly say, hey, you can forage mushrooms here, but it lets you know if it's um, DNR public land, if it's national forest or if it's private land. Um, so this is available on the web or as, on, like, as a phone app. Uh, unfortunately, it is a paid subscription, but it's only $30 a year. So if you're serious about hunting um, mushrooms or other things, it's a pretty good investment, in my opinion. Um, the features are really nice, and I know a lot of like commercial mushroom hunters that use this app and swear it up and down. <laughs> All right. So your other option then beyond private land is foraging on national forests. So we have three of these in Michigan broken up into five different parcels. We have the Ottawa National Forest up here, the Hiawatha, which is two parcels in the UP. And then in the Lower Peninsula, we have the Huron-Manistee National Forests as well. So some, you can harvest uh, mushrooms off of any of these lands, any of the national forests. Um, but some of them do require a pass, like a day pass to get in. So you can get like a yearly annual pass. Um, I think those are like $30 or some of the areas such as trailheads, picnic areas or river access areas work, require a day pass, which I think are like no more than five bucks. Um, but those are only if you're going to a trailhead picnic area or river access. And then beyond access to the area, you don't need any special permit to harvest wild anything. Um, wild edibles, including mushrooms. Uh, you'll need a special permit if you're trying to collect like firewood and that kind of stuff, but mushrooms fall under that wild edible category and are fair game. And so here are those websites for you as well if you want to check out the details. So where not to forage, just to reiterate, you may not forage off of national parks. Um, so you can forest on harvest on national forests, but not national parks and you can't um, harvest off of metro or county parks. And then again, please don't harvest off of the natural education reserve. Um, it's really tempting sometimes, but I have this rule with my young kids called leave nature in nature um, because this land was dedicated for education and it's hard to teach people about mushrooms if they've all been picked. So please just leave them be um, and we'll find them some other place. All right. Uh, if you have any questions about foraging rights, uh, you can put them in the chat or save them. I'll get into more details about it at the end of the presentation if needed, but I wanna keep us rolling into some basic mushroom ID things. Um, again, uh, mushroom ID can be super difficult. Um, this is my favorite mushroom ID book. It's by David Aurora. It's called Mushrooms Demystified, and it's very thick and the text is very small. <laughs> um, but we don't need to be in that much of detail when we're picking edible mushrooms. Uh, we just need to know some basics. So if we're talking about like a morel versus like this craterellus, um, very different things, but you don't have to be super technical about it. So let's see. When we're identifying wild mushrooms, it's helpful to know their structure. So like their general form, their spore bearing surface, and then their substrate. And by that, I mean, what do they grow on? So the structure here, I have an example of a choice edible morel and then a poisonous lookalike, the Verpo bohemica, which is the wrinkled thimble cap. Uh, when we're talking about the structure of this, pretty similar, right? The caps are similar. Um, this down here is called the stipe. Um, those are similar. The spore bearing surface, if someone was like, hey, check out this morel mushroom, um, and they're showing me a mushroom that has gills instead of pits, 
I'm going to be a little off put and then um, substrate. So if I saw a morel, a morel growing like on the side of a tree, um, that would concern me. And I would know that that is not a morel and I would not want to eat it. So those are just the three basic things that we're going to talk about when we're identifying these mushrooms today. Um, so what do these things mean? The basic parts of the structure that you need to be familiar with, first of all, are the cap. I think we can all agree what the cap is. It's this part of the mushroom up here and then the stipe. So those can vary from mushroom to mushroom. So the cap of this uh, pheasant right here is flat and fan shaped, where the cap of this shaggy mane is tall and slender. So those are easy words that we can use. And then stipe, you know, this stipe is pretty thin. It's a standard like stalk or stem, whereas this stipe is um, thicker and it goes into the tree. So those are important words. And then also some of the mushrooms, less this month, but more in the future, will have this annulus or uh, it's the ring that's left over from when the mushroom was a baby and it was like in a little egg and it had this thing called a veil. Um, and then it pops out of the veil and the remnant of that is the, the annulus ring. So we'll need to know the stipe, which is um, stalk or the stem, and the cap, which I think we can all agree on. All right. And then you'll also want to know the spore bearing surface. So the spore bearing surface and the color of both the surface and the spores are often used in identification. We're not going to worry about spore color because taking a spore print um, involves picking the mushroom, setting out on a plate, and then waiting a day. And I honestly cannot wait that long to eat my mushrooms. So we're not going to use that, um, but we will talk about what is the spore bearing surface. So common ones that we need to concern ourselves with are gills. So this is an oyster mushroom that has gills, just like you would think of fish gills, you know, through these lines. They can have pores like this, um, the caryoporus squamosus, the pheasant back, has these pores and they have very different sizes. Um, I don't think you guys can well, but this is also a polypore. Um, and has very tiny pores on the side, whereas the Arsquimosa has huge pores. And then the other one that we need to consider is just like a smooth hymenium. So hymenium is just the word for a spore bearing surface. And sometimes they don't have gills or pores or anything like that. And it's just smooth. Pores are on a smooth surface like our um, black trumpets. And again, there are many more um, spore bearing surfaces that we can have, but these are the three that we need to concern ourselves with today. And lastly, we're talking substrate. So this is probably the most um, challenging aspect for people um, is the substrate. And so I'm talking about ecology here and like how these mushrooms feed themselves. Um, so there are three main guilds that mushrooms are broken up into. Um, again, mycology is very sticky, but we can, we'll, we'll stick to these three ones for today. So. Um, what they, how they eat is going to depend where they grow and that'll help us find them, right? So if a mushroom is parasitic, that means that the species is taking nutrients from its host without giving anything back. It's a parasite um, and parasites need living hosts. So parasitic mushrooms are going to grow on living trees like this chaga here. Uh, sapotrophic mushrooms grow on dead trees and debris. Um, so this is a honey mushroom here, and it's a, these are decomposers. So this honey mushroom is feeding on this stump. They can grow on logs, uh, leaves, grass, anything, anything that would decompose, wood chips, um, that kind of stuff. Um, your mushrooms can grow out of your compost sometimes. So those are sapotrophic mushrooms. And then we also have mycorrhizal mushrooms, which I find this ecology guild the most interesting. Um, because they're going to form a mutualistic association with tree roots. So their mycelium, um, the like the, the fungus, you know, the mushroom is just the fruit and body. The mycelium uh, forms underground connections with tree roots. Um, so it's going to look like these mushrooms are just growing straight out of the ground, um, but they're still associated with the tree. They're really interesting because a mycorrhizal association um, the, the mycelium is pretty much using the tree as a carbon farm. The tree is photosynthesizing and the mushroom is taking those car carbohydrates um, in exchange for extended uh, root surface area. So helping the tree get more nutrients and water. So it's good for both the mushroom and the tree. Um, so mycorrhizal mushrooms will grow right out of the ground. Your sapotrophic mushrooms are going to grow on dead trees and other debris. And then your parasitic mushrooms are going to grow on living trees. Okay. 
So I think that gets into the basics of our mushroom ID before, oops, before I move on. Are there any like questions about this slide in particular um, that anyone wants me to back up and address? Do we understand these okay? So now the bread and butter of it, <laughs> our June wild edibles. Um, so uh, some of these mushrooms that we're gonna talk about today really only fruit in June and others are gonna fruit throughout the season, but these are some that you can focus on looking for this month. Um, so yes, we're talking about pheasants back. I'm talking about trumpets, uh, chicken of the woods and shaggy mane. And these are generally what they look like. I'm gonna start with my first one, which is pheasants back, Caryoporus squamosa. Um, it's a nice, beautiful mushroom in my opinion, grows in these shelf things like this. All right, so, okay. Some other common names for this mushroom are dryad saddle or um, pig nose, hog nose when they're young. So this is a young specimen down here in the middle. Um, you can see why it's called a pig nose. Um, these are like preferred choice edible for a lot of folks. Um, I tend to, this is one that I harvested this weekend. Um, I tend to wait for them to get a little bit bigger than that. And then over here, you can see this is a picture of a pheasant. This is why they're called pheasant back. Um, these mushrooms are some of the first spring mushrooms. They come up at the same time as morels. So if anyone was hunting morels um, this year, I want to hear in the chat, like how many morels you picked, like one, two, 10, like a hundred. How did we do? I want to know. I'll put, I'll put how many I picked in the chat. Any morale hunters out there? Okay, Rod's with me. Oh, Jake picked 12. That's pretty good. Who's got the highest morale number? I found one, but it was past its prime. Oh yeah. That's a good, that's a good point, Allie, just to lead them. Because I found five. Okay, so Jake is our our reigning champion, but I found none. <laughs> I am with Rod, I found none. Um so these are a great, pheasants back are like a great consolation prize for me when I'm out hunting morales um, and I just don't find anything. I will likely find some pheasants back. They're very common and they're easy to identify. So they're a great beginner's mushroom and also their taste is pretty mild. So it's nothing crazy that's gonna scare you or any of your dinner guests. Um, they come up in early spring and then again in the fall. Sometimes you'll see the mushroom persist through the summer, um, but those are not those are usually too old to eat. Um, they prefer the cooler temperatures. So the good things are gonna fruit in the spring. And then again, when it starts cooling off in the fall. So how do we identify these mushrooms? We can start with their structure. Uh, they grow, they can be fairly large, like two hand sizes large. Um, and then they can also be really small when they start, but they can get big. Their cap is fan shaped. So it'll, sometimes it's like a little funnel, but most of the time it's fanned out. Um, it's brownish and it darkens with age. So you can see this specimen here is young and uh, choice. It's still pretty orange, but there, as it gets darker, even if it's small, that can be an indication that it's old and probably past its prime. And then the cap is covered with these overlapping brown scales. That's what gives it, give it its name, pheasant's back, uh, look like feathers. And if you're interested in the etymology of the, the word, so these little things right here are called squamules. So that's why it's called a squamosis. Um, just means like scales. Um, Latin binomials can be our friends. They can, they can tell us about mushrooms, um, about what it looks like. Um, their stipe, so again, this stalk part, the stipe is tough and very thick. Um, I, you don't eat that part, you eat just the, the cap. Um, and it can be black at the base. So if it's black at the base, don't worry. It's not molding or dirty. That's just what they do. Um, and then it branches out of its substrate um, in these like bracket shelf things. So they are in a guild um, of shelf and bracket mushrooms. Anything that kind of grows off a tree like that is called a shelf or bracket mushroom. Okay. They're spore bearing surface. So caryoporous, you know, they're very porous. Um, so they have, huge pores when they're past their prime. Um, they're angular, um, very big. And so they're in a guild called polypores as well. 
So anything with these little pores, their spore bearing surface with pores is a polypore. Um, and these, this mushroom used to be in the genus polypore. So it used to be called polyporus squamosus um, before it was reclassified into the karyoporus. So if you're on the internet and you're seeing it say polyporus squamosus, it's the same mushroom. It just goes by a new name now. Um, the spore bearing surface is creamy white to yellow. Um, so if it's turned brown or like black, you don't want to eat that. Um, and it's best to find these mushrooms when they're young and the spores are like still really tiny. If they're big and fanned out like this, it's inedible and it's going to be too tough. It's not poisonous, but it's not going to taste good. Um, another good test for these, you know, these pores are so small, you can barely see them. Another good test is once you harvest it, if you can scratch it off with your thumbnail or something, then it's probably a good specimen to eat. It's substrate. So these are, they're both, some mushrooms can go both ways. They're parasitic and also sapotrophic. So they're parasitic in living trees, um, especially maple trees, things in the um, Acer genus. So they're commonly found with silver maple and box elder. And then they're sapotrophic on dead trees. So they're decomposing dead trees, um, especially when the tree is barkless. I think this is because they have a hard time puncturing through the bark. So they're not going to fruit. Um, until the bark has already come off, come off the tree. Um, but here we have some specimens down here that are pretty large, but they're not brown yet. So I would want to check the pores on these to see if they're still edible. They, they seem a little bit too big to be choice, but um, if the pores were small on these ones right here, I would probably still take them. Um, and then they can grow uh, single, like this, singly, or they can grow in those layer shelves that we saw on this slide. Okay, some other notes that I have about the pheasant's back mushroom is that you don't really have to worry about poisonous ones with this one. There are almost no polypore mushrooms that are poisonous, though a lot of them are inedible. So this one that I held up earlier is really woody. Um, you wouldn't want to eat that. So if you pick something really hard to <laughs> mistake, they're very like common and they have a distinct appearance. Um, but if you pick something and you're like slicing it up and you're like, this is really woody and you eat it and it's not a pheasant's back, you're probably going to be okay. You probably won't digest it, but it's not going to hurt you. There's not a lot of poisonous polypores. Um, again, they grow at the same time as morels and then again in the fall. So a great consolation prize if you're like me and you didn't find any morels this year. Um, and then they're best with their they're fresh. One cool trick is to, if you smell it and it smells like cucumber or melons, that's probably a a good specimen. Um, they're best if you thin them, slice them thinly, like on a mandolin. That's how I was doing mine. Um, that one that I picked this weekend, and then here's me frying it. Um, they give off a lot of water when they're cooked, so don't get scared. That's just what they do. Um, and any mushroom, you always want to cook it thoroughly before you consume it. So these ones, you will know that they're cooked thoroughly when all the water has evaporated. That's a good sign. Um, and then there have been no known allergic reactions to these mushrooms. So they're really mild, gentle beginner's mushrooms. All right. Okay, any questions about the pheasant's back mushroom before I move on to my trumpets? All right. So the next mushroom I wanna to talk to you guys about today is our trumpets, our Cradolaurus species. So they look like this. Um, and if you're a little bit familiar with mushrooms, you might think that these are chanterelles um, because that is their other common name. Um, so the chanterelle family um, includes a whole bunch of different genera of mushrooms and these are one of them. The Cradolaurus um, look a lot like them and they used to be considered chanterelles, but now they've been as a lot of things have been reclassified. Uh, so we have several species of craterellus in Michigan, all of which are edible. So you don't have to worry if it looks like this, it's probably good <laughs> to eat. Um, there are six species that we commonly find here that I had listed, but I won't bore you by reading them all. Um, and they come in a variety of different colors. Um, most of them are yellow or black like this. So there's, they're in two different groups. Um, when we're talking about craterellus, we have either the black trumpets, which is the one behind me, or we have these um, chanterelles, they're just called chanterelles, <laughs> um, 
or yellow chanterelles, um, even though they are craterellus and not canterellus, which is the central genus. Um, these ones are gonna fruit in June. So craterellus, um, this specific species of chanterelles have a very short season, <laughs> um, which is June. I'll talk more about chanterelles, the other chanterelles, um, probably next month, but these ones are only found in June. So I wanted to get them out this month. Um, they mostly are found in deciduous forests and bogs, um, found in bogs because they're common in moss. And they do have a poisonous lookalike that I will talk about later. Um, so you'll notice that each of our intro cards for our different genera have these uh, cards for your reference of season habitat and poisonous lookalike. Structure of these guys. Um, they're small to medium. They can be pretty little. Um, so you need a lot of them to make a nice meal. Um, and they're brownish gray to yellow in color. Um, and they have like this funnel shaped and they fan out more as maturity. So they're going to be like a tube at first. And then as they become more mature, um, they, they kind of like fan out. And then their stipe. Um, which again is this stock thing, is hollow. So that's a good tell if you're not sure if it's a um, trumpet or not, if the stipe is hollow, um, that's a pretty easy tell. Um, but you have to watch out because there's um, bugs in there. I have had, I've heard people pull mealworms out of there, pull beetles out of their ants. So, you know, just watch out um, because what a good home for a little bug. Um, I have here, this is a black trumpet, black trumpet. These are pretty rare, um, so rare that we don't even know what score colors they have. Um, and then this is the winter chanterelle. This is uh, um, more common in the craterellus uh, genus. All right, there's spore bearing surface. So if you want to check out a mushroom um, and you want to know where, you know, a great identification tool is the spore bearing surface. So our black trumpets, um, our first group, they have smooth hymenium. So I was talking about how the spores can just be on a smooth surface. Um, they can kind of start to get into where they're having these wrinkly gills on top, but most of it is going to be smooth. And then our, our yellow trumpets um, or the yellow chanterelles, they have pseudo gills. So most, when we're talking about mushroom gills, they're going to be sharp, um, but these ones are blunt and rounded. So that's a tell from its poisonous look lookalike is that these ones are going to have rounded gills and their gills are also gonna be decurrent, um, which means that they're kind of like forking and they might not run all the way down to the bottom. As you can see in this picture here, this is a good example of decurrent gills. They have all these forks right here. And you can also tell in this picture that they're pretty rounded and blunt. So our black ones are gonna be smooth, maybe a little bit of wrinklage, and the yellow ones are gonna be, um, have pseudo gills, blunt gills um, that are decurrent. And then lastly, their substrate, how do they feed? What do they grow on? So they're mycorrhizal or maybe sapotrophic. We don't really know. Um, mushrooms are an enigma, uh, but we do know that they grow out of the ground. <laughs> um, so you'll find them growing sometimes in, in small clusters um, or singly. So you can see here this, again, this is a rare mushroom, um, but they can be found in clumps or they can kind of be found one at a time but they're not gonna be connected together. So the stipe, the stem, they're all individual. Um, they're not gonna be connecting to one um, main like base stipe. Um, they grow in mixed forests and conifer bogs. Um, so bogs is often where they're found because these things are hard to see on the ground um, because of their color and they're just really small. So they're often found with moss. So that's, I think that's why they're often found in bogs. But when they're growing in association with trees, they're mostly found with oaks and beaches. So if you're in an oak or beach uh, forest, you're probably in the right spot for these guys. Um, and then again, they can grow singly scattered or in these like little group clusters. All right. So other notes about these is that I mentioned this earlier, the entire family of Cantharelle ACE, which is the chanterelle family, is commonly known as chanterelles. Um, so a couple of our craterellus um, species were just very recently moved over to this. So um, that black trumpet, that one used to be uh, cantharellus. So if you see it on the internet and it's referred to as cantharellus, it's the same mushroom. It, this was just recently made. And then also that winter um, chanterelle, craterellus tuberae 
tuberiformis, um, used to be cantharellus. So same mushroom, it's the same family, they're all edible, all cantharellus and all craterellus mushrooms are edible. So either way that they're referred to, they are, you're okay. <laughs> Um, but I did mention that these guys have a poisonous lookalike. So that is the jack-o'-lantern mu uh, jack mushroom, Amphilodus ludens. Um, this is what this guy looks like. Uh, they are deadly poisonous, so avoid them. <laughs> um, one main thing is that they are bright yellow color. So you're not going to mistake them with any of our black trumpets. Uh, you're more likely to mistake them with some of those yellow trumpets, the yellow chanterelles. Um, these ones fruit in the fall, so that's also a good tell as um, these, the craterellus ones, fruit in June. That's when they do their thing. Um, so if you think you're finding a craterellus in the fall, double check yourself. <laughs> um, these ones also have true gills, so their gills are going to be sharp um, and not rounded. Uh, they're sapotrophic, so they're going to grow on wood or at the, or at tree bases. So if you know, you see a mushroom and it's growing on a rotting log, um, that's a sign that it's not one of these chanterelles, it's not a trumpet, it's probably um, jack-o'-lantern. And then the biggest tell for me is that they're, they have bioluminescence. So these mushrooms will glow in the dark. <laughs> if you pick a jack-o'-lantern and then, or you just stumble upon it in the night, which is really cool, um, they glow in the dark very faintly, but it's still really neat. Um, and I don't know of any other mushrooms in Michigan that do that. Um, also, I mentioned earlier that the stipe of our trumpets is single, where the stipe of this lookalike, they all kind of come together into one mound. So you can pick them out of the ground like they've done here um, all together, whereas our chanterelles, um, the trumpets, they're single. You'll pick them out singly. Okay. And I did see a question in the chat before I move on to my next um, mushroom. Nancy is asking, when we cook these, do you use butter, oil? How long do you cook? Um, I use just like a little bit of oil, especially for the pheasants back because they give off so much water. Um, and I'll just cook them until all of that water evaporates. Um, the mushroom will get tender. Um, that's how you know um, if your mushroom is still like really firm, it's probably not cooked all the way through. Um, in uncooked, most uncooked mushrooms are still safe. You're just not going to digest them. So you're not going to get any of the nutrient benefits. Um, there's only a couple of mushrooms that you have to cook for them to be safe. But yeah, just cook them until the water that they give off evaporates and until they're like nice and tender. Erica has found some other bioluminescent mushrooms in Michigan that aren't that weren't these jack-o'-lanterns. So maybe I have some research to do. That'll um, I have homework now, Erica. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Okay. I'm gonna move on to my next mushroom, which is the chicken of the woods. Um, I want to know, go off in the chat if you've heard of chicken of the woods, if you've seen it, if you've eaten it, or if you've not heard about it. I want to know like. Who has heard of chicken of the woods? I feel like this is a really common mushroom. Really commonly talked about mushroom. Uh, Brian has heard of it, but not eaten it. Anyone else have heard of this mushroom? Has anyone had the pleasure of eating this mushroom? Nancy's heard of it. That's nice. So we, we had a poll for this, Leah. Do you want to launch the poll? I have launched the poll. Oh, um, so yes. So let me fill you in on the results. We have two people who have not heard of it. We have Ooh. four people each who have heard of it and have seen slash eaten it. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. So this is a like super common, like when people talk about ed edible mushrooms and like, let's find chicken in the woods or let's find head of the woods. Um, so if you haven't heard of it, welcome. Now you have. Um, this is a great mushroom. Very, very tasty. Um, thanks for launching that poll, Allie. Um, I saw this other question about poisonous mushrooms. I will get to it. Um, so let's get into chicken of the woods. So there's actually two different um, species that we're going to be talking about here. So chicken of the woods, the Latiporus, Latiporus species. Um, so their other common name is sulfur shelf. Um, and that I think it's because they're yellow like this. They're kind of sulfury. Um, and there are two choice edible specimens of this species that grow in Michigan. 
which is the Latoporus cincinnatus and the Latoporus sulfurus. Um, so the cincinnatus one, that's this um, more pale orangey one. That one is what is chicken of the woods is its most common name. Um, and then when we're saying sulfur shelf, that's referring to the Latoporus sulfurus um, mushroom. That one's not really referring to our other one. Um, so they're, the fruit is best, the mushroom is best when it's moist and firm and a little bit spongy. Um, sometimes these will persist off, uh, on the tree past their prime and just like get woody and dry. Um, so just check this, you know, just give it a squeeze. How does it feel? Um, if it gets, starts to get, to get corky, um, then it's past its prime and it's no good. So these ones start fruiting in May. Um, they'll go through June um, and then they'll start back up again in the fall. Um, grow on deciduous trees. We'll talk about the specific trees as well. And there's no really reasonable poisonous lookalikes with this one. Again, these are in the um, polypore family. So there, there's not a lot of poisonous polypores out there. Right. So let's talk about the structure of these guys. Uh, so they can get really big. Um, large specimens can weigh up to 50 pounds or more. Um, it's not uncommon to, if you harvest the whole thing, just like it's like you have a baby. <laughs> so now I'm gonna talk about these kind of separately because they are a little bit different in some ways. Our Cincinnatus, um, that one is a muted orange um, and it's got white on the caps on the end. So it's, it's more of a muted orange and then the tips are white. And it grows in this shelf-like rosette pattern. Um, it's often found like on the base of a tree on the ground. Um, whereas our uh, Latoporus sulfurus, um, sulfur shelf, is bright orange um, and the tips especially are bright yellow and bright orange and it grows in a shelf-like cluster. So this one is more of a shelf whereas the other one is like a rosette pattern. And on both of these uh, species, the stipe, that stem is more or less absent. So you won't really see, you know, the, the shell, it's just like coming right out and there's not a stem before the shelf. Right. The spores of these ones, um, again, they're pores, so they're in the polypore gill. Um, for our Cincinnatus, the chicken of the woods, it has a white pore surface. And for the sulfur shelf, the Latoporus sulfurus, it has a bright yellow pore surface. So I have a quiz. <laughs> Ali, if you wanna launch the poll, I wanna quiz you guys. Looking at this picture, what species of chicken of the woods do you think it is? Do you think it's the Cincinnatus of, or the sulfurous? So Ali, let me know how the class does. Looking at this picture. Oh, oh, it's gonna provide an answer. All right, so 42% believe that it is the, I'm not going to pronounce the first word because I know I will fail. 42% believe this is the Cincinnatus and 58% believe this is the Sulfurious. Awesome. Okay, cool. So this is good to know. Um, it could be either of these and neither of them will kill you. Um, but this is the sulfurous one. This is our sulfur shelf. Um, this is much more yellow than it is white. Um, the other, the other one is white and also a tell is that it's growing on the tree. Um, so that'll help as well. You're not going to see your Cincinnatus growing on a tree sometimes, but very rarely. Um, the only reason you might want to distinguish between these two species of chicken of the woods is that the sulfur shelf um, is known, it, some people can have uh, like just upset stomach when they consume a lot of it, um, but that's not really a problem with the Cincinnatus uh, species. So if you're, if you have a sensitive stomach, maybe go for the Cincinnatus and not this um, sulfur shelf. All right, so lastly onto the substrate, how does it, where does it grow? How does it eat? Um, so these ones, again, they are parasitic when the tree is alive, and then they switch to being sapotrophic when they are dead. So sapotrophic, again, meaning it's decomposing things, um, and parasitic meaning that it's you know, parasitizing off of its host. Um, so they're most commonly found with 
oaks. Uh, so anything of the quercus uh, species, though they can be found on a variety of other trees, such as you know walnuts. Um, let's see, walnuts and chestnuts. Those are the only other two that I can think of right now. Um, but mostly oaks. Um, that's a very safe. If you see this, if you see something that you think could be a chicken of the woods and it's on an oak tree, that's a good sign. Um, our Cincinnatus, these ones, are going to grow at the base of a tree or sometimes on a stump of a tree, like of a dead tree that would um, be cut. And sometimes they can be appear growing out of the ground in this rosette pattern um, because there's like a tree that's buried underneath some leaf litter. And then our Latoporus sulfurus, um, this one, sulfur shelf, is going to grow on the side of a tree. So it'll be parasitic when the tree is alive. And then once it has finally killed the tree, it'll turn sapotrophic and begin decomposing the tree. Um, so yeah, these ones, this one mostly, if you see it terrestrial growing out of the ground, don't be scared. It probably just means that there's like a log or something buried underneath or that there was a tree um, root there or like tree stump there that got cut that you just can't see anymore. Um, but your sulfurous one is almost always growing on a log or a tree. All right, some other notes on these ones. Um, they are, so when you're harvesting them, um, the brackets or the rosette, that whole, you can take that whole thing if you want. Um, the mycelium's in the tree, so it'll grow back. Um, it's also sustainable to remove just the more desirable tips because the tips are gonna be the best part and the inside of that bracket is a little bit more quirky. Um, and not really as good, um, not really choice edible. Um, and that's cool because if you just harvest the tips, if you just cut off of like one, two, three inches of the tip, it'll regrow sometimes in the same season, sometimes as quickly as two or three weeks later. So if you mark on your GPS where it was, uh, you can go back and harvest the same mushroom again. Um, like I said, they're likely to fruit on the same tree repeatedly year after year season after season. So if you find a spot that has these, write it down, mark it on your DPS. Don't tell your friends. <laughs> you don't want them to get to a purse. Um, so these ones, again, with the sulfurous ones, they can uh, cause a little bit of a upset stomach. It's even worse if they grow on conifer trees. I'm not exactly certain why, but um, these species, if they grow on a pine tree or a hemlock or something like that, anything conifer should be avoided. They can cause an allergic reaction and or gastrointestinal distress, um, which is no fun. Um, the species that we have to worry about up here in this um, genus is Latoporus conifericlora, <laughs> um, which looks very similar. Um, it's not quite as bright as, a, as our sulfurous, um, looks a little bit, it's not quite growing in a rosette, but it looks very similar. It, I can see how this could be easily mistaken. Um, it's inedible, you don't wanna eat this one. So, you know, check, always be aware what the substrate is when you're harvesting it. If it's a downed, you know, pine tree, a living pine tree, just leave it. You don't want it. You don't want that allergic reaction. Um, Note on this is that these are not to be mistaken with hen of the woods. Chicken of the woods and hen of the woods are different. Um, your hen of the woods is Graffola frondosa, Fron frondosa, yes. <laughs> um, and those are brown and they fruit later, like in August. And so we'll talk about those um, in our August mushrooms of the month. But yeah, so we have both the chicken of the woods and hen of the woods. Um, so much poultry of the woods to look forward to. <laughs> okay, all right. On to my next mushroom. This one I wanted to include because I think they're a little freaky, they're a little fun. Um, so we have the shaggy mane. Um, this is the Caprinus comatus, um, which sounds like you're casting the spell, Caprinus comatus. Um, nice mushroom, very, very common. So these ones are also called the inky cap or the lawyer's wig. So maybe they're called the wig because they like, this looks like a wig, looks like a shaggy mane. And they're called inky cap because it does this thing over here. Um, so they're a very common mushroom. They're easy to find. They're found in yards all over the place. Um, they're lots of them. You'll encounter them and not even realize it. Um, they fruit after cold rains. So if it's, you know, their season is May through October-ish. So if we have a nice cold rain, you might think to yourself, hey, I could get some Caprinus comatis. Um, 
But the main thing with this one and why they're called the inky cap is that their cap will click quickly um, deliquesce, deliquesce um, which means that the gills liquefy. Um, so they're gonna turn the, the cap, this nice, beautiful white cap is just gonna melt into this uh, moist, inky, black goop. Um, and at that point, they're not poisonous, um, but they're also not edible. They're just not really good. Um, so the season for these ones is May through October. Their habitat, they're found in yards and in grasslands. So they, they grow out of the grass mostly. Um, and as you'll see in all these pictures, they're all in grass. Um, they have a poisonous lookalike asterisk. So not deadly poisonous, but one that you should be aware of. All right. So the structure of these ones, their cap is white and slender and rounded. Um, kind of makes like this bulbous thing. We looked at this picture earlier. Um, a lot, or one thing. <laughs> so they have these um, peeling brown scales on them. Sometimes they're just white, but they are gonna have some sort of peeling elevated raised scale that you can like pick at. Um, the stipe is white. It's hollow, so you can see in this picture right here, um, it's hollow, just like our morels have a hollow stipe. Um, and it can be, when they're at maturity, brittle, um, just like breaks off. Um, there's not a lot of like fruit to it, not a lot of oomph to the stipe. And then some of them will also have this annulus ring left over from their veil. Um, if it's missing this, don't worry, sometimes they just fall off, um, but, that can be a tell also that it's the Caprinus clematis is that it has this ring. And then their spore bearing surface. So it has, they do have gills. Um, we don't really get to see them because they just immediately melt um, and they're tightly packed. So there's a whole bunch of gills in here. Someone um, spread them out for us so we could see, but there's a whole bunch of gills in here and they deliquesce, they melt at maturity. Um, and so, like I said, they're not poisonous at that point, but they're not really edible. So you wanna get them when there is no turning at all. Like this one right here, you could cut that part off, um, this like turning part right here and eat the top. Um, but if you're gonna pick one, I would pick one that looks like this. Um, if it starts to turn at the bottom, that's inedible. It's not very good, it's just kind of mushy. Um, and then, I mean, I don't really think anyone would go for a mushroom like this. Um, not poisonous at that state. So if they turn a little bit on you, it's okay. Um, they're just not very tasty. Not very appealing. All right. And my last um, thing, the substrate. So they're sapotrophic, which remind me, um, what does sapotrophic have? Uh, or what does that mean? Uh, Allie, we have another quiz, right? For our friends. <laughs> You guys able to see this poll? Are you getting quiz? Quiz is on. We are getting polled. Nice. Got to make sure you guys are paying attention. <laughs> All right. Could you do the honor of reminding me what sapotrophic means, Allie? Okay. Well, most people have guessed that that means that it is a decomposer. Most people would be correct. <laughs> so to be saphotropic means that you're gonna decom you're decomposing. Um, they're feeding on uh, grass and other debris, so wood chips, sometimes uh, leaves, that kind of stuff. But mostly they feed on uh, grass, nutrient, uh, nitrogen-rich grass. Um, so they're found in lawns, grasslands, and in wood chips. Um, they can even fruit in hard packed soils, which I find is interesting. A lot of mushrooms have a hard time, like packed soil is really bad for fungus in general, um, but these ones will puncture through really hard packed soil, which is interesting. You'll just see like dirt and a little bit of grass and then one of these mushrooms, it's cool. Um, they can fruit in groups like you can see here, um, but they're not connected. Again, the stipes are individual. They're not gonna branch back to a main stipe. Um, they're single. Um, they can fruit in groups, but they're not connected. Okay. So we have two slides of other notes because these ones are a doozy. Um, so 
generally the stipe is not very good. It's brittle and tough. Um, it's not great to eat. So you just want to eat the, the cap. So you can just cut the stem um, right below the cap. Um, if you find an inky mushroom, that's still a win because fresh ones may be nearby. Um, you can like dig them out of the ground before the cap has even completely emerged out of the soil. Just make sure that it's got the scales on it and that kind of stuff because you don't want to accidentally be picking up like an amanita egg or something like that. Um, but yeah, if they're like starting to emerge from the ground and like the little bit of their cap is still kind of under the ground, that's a good time to pull them um, because then you have a minute before they, they start to deliquesce, before they start to melt. Um, so on that, you want to cook them immediately or submerge them in cold water to keep them from uh, melting from turning to ink um, and I mean immediately as in like immediately uh, they can completely melt in 24 hours um, and they'll start to turn in less than half an hour of from emerging from the ground so even before you pick them they'll start to do that um, so cook them before any discoloration is shown on the lower edges of the cap if it does do that you can just cut it off and cook the rest um, and then when you cook them um, in some oil or butter you can then just freeze them in an air airtight container. I also know people who pickle them raw. That'll keep them from um, starting to turn into that inky stuff. Um, and then submerging them in cold water will um, buy you some time, but it's not a long-term solution. So if you know you're not going to get to them for like a week or so, um, I would cook them and then freeze them. All right. And then my poisonous asterisk lookalike. Um, this is the Tipler's bane. Uh, which is a close relative, not quite in the same genus, um, but looks a little bit similar. These, uh, the main difference, so these ones are also gonna like ink up on you, they're gonna deliquesce, but the main difference is that they're not gonna have scales on the top, they have a smooth cap without scales. Um, and these ones, they're not gonna kill you, um, but especially if you drink them with like alcohol, like you're having some mushrooms and wine, <laughs> um, they can cause some, not so fun reactions, including like redness of the face, um, like nausea and vomiting, um, all that kind of stuff, which is no fun. Um, but the reaction will subdue within a few hours. So you don't need to rush to the hospital unless you're feeling really bad um, and you're not gonna die, <laughs> but you're gonna be in some discomfort for a while. So this is a poisonous lookalike, be aware of these ones, make sure it has those scales that you can learn. All right. So that um, are our, those were our four mushrooms that I wanted to introduce you to um, this month. I have some best practices coming next, but I wanted to know if anyone has any specific questions about these mushrooms that I can cover. If they're fresh on your mind, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I can let y'all, yeah, feel free to put them in the chat if you like. Um, we did have a question a little bit earlier about what to do with poisonish mushrooms when you do come across them. Oh, thank you for the reminder, Ellie. Yeah, so that's, I mean, up to you. <laughs> I'm a believer that, you know, everything has a role in the ecosystem. Their ecology is all connected, so I just leave them be. Um, I know some people, especially with false morels, really just don't like them and will kick them over. I mean, I guess that's your choice, but my thing is just, you know, leave them be, just don't touch them. They're a poisonous, the only way that you can die from a mushroom or like get poisoned by a mushroom is by eating it. So even if you pick a poison mushroom and you inspect it, you're gonna be okay. Um, you don't need to be afraid of mushrooms unless you're deciding to eat them. That is where the risk starts. All right, cool. And again, you will get this uh, PDF of the slideshow and this recording um, in a follow-up email. So you can reference all that. Any special trees for chicken of the woods? So chicken of the woods is mostly on oak. Those are what I would uh, focus on. All, all sorts of oaks. And they're a, they're a sign usually that your oak is having trouble. It has a wound. They will um, infest the wound and that's kind of when they start to fruit because um, they're parasitic. So they need something to kind of open that up for them and then they can get in there and infest your oak. Do chicken of the wood taste different if grown on living tree versus dead? Maybe, 
Um, so substrate does matter, um, like a wild forage mushroom versus a mushroom that's grown, like cultivated, um, they taste different. Like, you know, buying fresh produce, <laughs> you're welcome. Um, if buying fresh produce versus like store produce, you know, they taste different. But as far as like living versus dead, I don't, can't tell the difference. And I haven't heard that. So um, I wouldn't think it would be a significant difference. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll wrap us up with some best practices and then we can go on to some resources. And if you have any more burning questions about anything, I can answer them at that time. So my best practices first with foraging. So I just have this whole list for you guys. Just buckle up with me. Um, so firstly, I just want to reiterate that you should only harvest mushrooms if you're certain of the identification. If you don't know, don't risk it. Just leave. There's going to be another chance where you stumble upon this mushroom. Um, it's okay. Just leave it um, because once you've taken it out of the wild, it's way harder to identify. Um, and then only harvest mushrooms if you intend to eat them. Uh, if you already have dinner plans, uh, maybe don't pick a mushroom or if you don't have a way to cook them because someone else would probably like to eat that mushroom. Uh, I think it's just more respectful. Uh, if you're not gonna use something, don't harvest it, right? Um, another rule generally is like you don't wanna disturb the mycelium. So when appropriate, cut at the base and no lower. You don't wanna dig them out um, unless it's like, the Caprinus comatus, even then you'll want to like cut at the dirt. You don't want to disturb the mycelium because that is like the, um, the, the mushroom is just the fruiting body. I'll come back to this. I always like this analogy about an apple tree. So the mycelium is the tree and the mushroom is like the apple. You can pick as many apples as you want and not hurt the tree. But once you start, you know, taking chops at the tree, um, you know, you start disturbing the mycelium. That's when it's going to stop making fruit. So leave the mycelium, don't compact your soil, don't mix up, don't till the soil, that kind of stuff. Um, generally, you should always store mushrooms in containers that allow for gas exchange. So like in paper bags, I always take paper bags when I'm harvesting or like in a handkerchief, something like that. Um, and you never want to put mushrooms in an air airtight container. So never put them in Ziploc. Um, I don't even put mine in like black, uh, plastic grocery bags. It works in the short term, but you want to let them breathe. Um, and then mark the location of where you've harvested. So a lot of these mushrooms that we talked about today will grow in the same spot over and over again. Um, so they'll, they'll grow on the same tree even. Um, so if you know where a tree is, you know, that's a mark where it is. Um, and then only harvest from unpolluted substrates. So, you know, our Caprinus comatus, the shaggy mane, you're not gonna wanna harvest one of those that grows out of like some dyed wood chips or like treated wood chips or like, if you see one growing in your lawn, but you know, like you just fertilized a week ago um, or like you just sprayed like for pesticide or something like that, don't harvest those because don't eat those because uh, mushrooms are known. They're really good at uptaking pollutants um, and that kind of stuff from the environment. So be aware of where you're harvesting your mushrooms. Uh, just be safe, check it out, scope it out before you harvest, be aware. Um, and then my best practices for consumption. Um, again, only consume mushrooms if you are certain of the identification. Uh, don't risk it. You don't want to poison yourself. You don't want to upset your stomach. Um, just be careful. Uh, be smart with mushrooms. Make sure, take the time to thoroughly look at your mushroom to double check yourself before you consume anything. Um, always cook consuming. I mentioned earlier that like it's not going to kill you if it's a little bit raw, but if your best bet and your safest bet is to cook it thoroughly, um, if it gives off water, wait for all that water to evaporate, let the uh, meat get nice and tender. I know you're really excited to eat your mushroom, um, but let it cook. Um, and then especially when you're trying new mushrooms, always limit your portion size. So try a little bit first, um, give it, you know, a lot of reactions will can onset within the first 15 minutes. Um, so if you have some and you're okay, you can eat it again. There are some more dangerous mushrooms that can take, you know, up to 36 hours to set in, but I didn't talk about any of those today. So, but generally start with a little bit and then never consume more than one new species of mushroom at a time. So say you have a really good day and you find some pheasants back and some chicken in the woods, um, try one of them first, probably the pheasants back because the chicken in the woods will last longer. Um, because if you do have a reaction, uh, whoever is treating you is going to want to know exactly what you ate so they can best handle the situation. 
Um, can any of these be dried and stored? Yes, I actually, <laughs> that pheasant sack that I harvested this weekend, this stem, I cut up and dehydrated and stored and makes a really nice broth. Um, dehydrating mushrooms is a really good option in general or cooking and freezing uh, is a good option depending on what you're using them for. I would cook and freeze if you wanna eat them like in a saute like this, if you're gonna make them into a broth and you're just using them for their flavoring or their medicinal properties, then dehydrating is a really good option. All right, that is more or less all I've got for you. Um, lastly, I just wanted to share some of my um, favorite mycology resources. The Midwest American Mycological Information, um, MAMI is the leading, you know, they are the authority, <laughs> I would say, of mycology and wild foraged mushrooms, especially in the Midwest. Um, so their website is midwestmycology.org. They have lots of classes, lots of information. They will certify you to be a wild forage um, mushroom identification expert like myself. Um, you can also check out Learn Your Land. They have a really good YouTube channel um, and website where he, Adam Hartman is the guy's name. Uh, he talks about so many different cool things and a lot of that content is related to mushrooms. Um, it's seasonal and there is just so much content to explore there, mushrooms and more. Um, a cool thing I've recently been, sorry, that I've recently been getting into is called Shroomify, Mushroom ID USA. Um, so this is available on smartphones. I have tried so many different apps for Mushroom ID, um, Seek, iNaturalist, Picture This, like Mushroom ID, all of those apps. This one is my favorite because it's like, it walks it, you through it, it asks like, okay, what, how big is the cap? What is the cap color? What was it growing on? Um, and then it tells you what it thinks the mushroom is and it gives you a whole bunch of information like if it's edible, if it's in season, that kind of stuff. So that is a really great app, a really great um, like field guide to have in your back pocket more or less. And then one that I recently stumbled on is fungiwoman.com. Um, this is what she does, um, but there's some great information about a couple of the species that we talked about today and how to prepare them, like how to cook them. Um, so I would check out that one as well, uh, fungiwoman.com. And then lastly, um, you have the Boardman River Nature Center, the Grand Traverse Conservation District, and myself to help answer any questions um, and provide you more resources about mycology. Um, so you can reach me at ldiga at gtcd.org or call me at any time. You can show up at our Nature Center. We are open 11 to 2, Wednesday through Friday, and our website is natureiscalling.org. Um, lots of resources to come on that website as well. We're actively building it out. Um, that's all I got for you folks. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them in the chat. I'll stick around for a while. Um, I had a great time teaching you guys today. I hope everyone learns something. Um, this recording and the slide deck will come in an email soon. So if you registered, you'll get all that. Um, thanks for joining me tonight. That's about all I got. <laughs>